I feel like our relationship can be summed up through coffee. Mostly. Mostly. Through coffee. How we pour it on each other. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley, and today on the show we have Lucas Harger, who is the editor of Ballistic. He is a new collaborator of mine. It's the first time that I worked with an editor, which I have talked about on the show before. It was a really great experience. Lucas and I are going to talk about uh, that director-editor relationship and working on Ballistic since when we recorded this, we had just locked the cut, so it was very fresh in our minds, and we just held on to this episode to wait for Ballistic to come out so we could say all the things that we do say so we didn't have to be cryptic. We could be just open and honest. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsors like Benro. Benro makes a ton of really great filmmaking gear such as tripods and sliders and hi-hats. I really love their hi-hats. We used all that a ton on Ballistic. It's great to be able to put your camera wherever you want. And uh, their tripods are just extremely solid, uh, especially for the price. They're as good as uh, similar sticks three times their price. Similar to other companies that I collaborate with it's all about having really high quality without those really high prices and if you use the coupon code filmriot20 you can save 20% on benrousa.com so jump over to uh, filmriot.com forward slash podcast go to the episode page for this episode and find links to some of their gear I also want to thank Westcott which is an industry leading lighting manufacturer that specializes in lighting and light control for filmmakers around the world we've reviewed the flex light and the ice light on the show but they're so versatile and travel ready, especially the ice light. I shot uh, on a bigger budget project where I did second unit and I had to shoot in this forest area, but I didn't have any lights. So I just took an A7S and uh, an ice light and shot out this entire scene, which ended up cutting with Alexa footage seamlessly. So definitely check that out at filmriot.com forward slash podcast. They are really handy lights to have around. But now we're going to jump into it with Lucas. But before we do, just a little warning, there are some bad words in this episode and there have been been on some previous episodes and I'd like to hear from you guys. Would you rather us bleep these out? Just mute those words. So if you have kids around, uh, it's not an issue or just warnings in the beginning, shoot me a tweet and let me know what you think. We are working to improve this show as we go and we'd love your feedback on that. But now into it with Lucas. So I'm not going to release this till after we release Ballistic. Okay. That way Good. people have seen it That's and we had enough. publicly worked together by then, which we already publicly worked together because of the vlogs, I guess they are. But just for people that don't know yourself, I guess let's start with like, how did you get into this and what do you do primarily right now? It's a pretty standard getting into this story as far as... VHS making movies with my brothers growing up. Yeah. Did you do the VCR to VCR thing? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So there's definitely that aspect of it. But then kind of where a lot of other people go into skate videos, I went more into wakeboarding videos. I did not do the skate video thing. A lot of people do skate. Videos. I didn't do the wakeboard video thing either. Wow. Yeah. I just made short films. Yeah. We, we, we would do a lot of like little sketchy short things growing up. But then I got in really into wakeboarding videos just because I grew up in Michigan. And so there was a lot of wakeboarding where I grew up. Yeah. And the wakeboarding community is pretty small. So a lot of my friends rode in the X Games and as kind of all growing up. And so I had, I didn't have to, but I started to like make them sponsorship videos. That's awesome. So that's kind of where it started to get into more of like, and the thing that wakeboarding videos do or used to do more than skate videos is they would always have like a narrative thread, mm. like always, or like a sketch comedy thread. It wouldn't all just be wakeboarding. It was like a lot of lifestyle in wakeboard videos. Right. So that was kind of fun. And then I think it was just a roundabout way to where I am now to where I, I went to school for music business, but after I got out, I never really did anything with music business. And I knew <laughs> right. kind of in music business, I never wanted to do anything with music business. Cause but you figured, you know, why not take it anyway? Not? Yeah, for sure. Well, Everybody then, needs music business for taxes it's purposes. Perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> I think the actually kind of looking back, the only good thing with music business, it was just a lot of contract law. Oh, that's good. And creative contract law. We and have so, tons of that. <laughs> yeah. So music licensing contract, like I knew a lot of that stuff kind of coming out of school, Yeah, which was helpful. But then uh, after I graduated, I just moved into St. Louis and started freelancing. And Freelance editing specifically or did no, you do other stuff? Yeah, I kind of did everything. 
like even video production stuff for like small businesses and then web development, minor software, front end UI development stuff. So it was just kind of like all over the place. And it was just a process of whittling down what you wanted to do. Yeah. And then the job at the production and post house that I'm at now, they like posted a job for an editor and I applied and just kind of like really chased it, chased it down pretty hard. And I got the job and then I just sold all of my camera gear because I never wanted to shoot everything <laughs> right. and got rid of everything. And for, you know, the last five plus years have been able to hyper focus on editing exclusively. That's great. It's funny how that like the stuff when you were young, it doesn't matter for anything and is like kind of not even great. It's pretty terrible. Yeah. It's like that's the stuff that you're really finding the concepts, which is interesting, Yeah. which is why I'm always telling people when they're like, hey, what should I do next is make stuff, make tons and yeah, tons of sure. stuff, maybe stuff that nobody ever sees, but that's a stuff that's going to lead toward being able to make the stuff that yeah. people are going to want to see. I think that's such a huge thing. Because you get, I mean, you get to a point where it's like, I've done this, not yeah. something exactly like this, but I've done stuff in this world. I know how to sell this concept. Yeah. And it's like, if you've never picked up a camera, even beyond that, if you've never tried to tell a story in some way, a moment, you know, capture an audience's attention before, you're not going to, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. You need to do it over and over again to figure out, even when you're writing, I, I think one of the biggest teachers for me for writing is finishing. You yeah. know, I finished a short and then I looked at its shortcomings and then I'm like, this is what I should have done with the character, with mm -hmm. the moments, with the build, with the structure. And that's been like my biggest education for writing is just by doing things. And I think where, you know, people of our age, you know, pre YouTube, yeah. where we had the benefit was there was nothing else to get in our way. It's just, yeah. we did it because we loved it. And we were finding those concepts, not to show anybody because there was no one to show, yeah. but because we just really loved it. Now, yeah. thanks to YouTube and, you know, sometimes it, it looking like people just throw stuff out there out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, poof, it's great. And everybody loves it. Right. And they're getting all these views. It seems like there's this like misconception that you need an audience. Like I get that yeah. a lot. Like, how do I get views on my short? And then I look at it and you, you, well, you clearly just started doing this thing. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Build. Just make a bunch of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Until eventually, you know, you've made a hundred things that are not very good and your 101 is worth someone's time. Sure. So I think that's really missing right now. Thanks to YouTube and yeah. the immediate like view count, mm -hmm. you know, culture that we have now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I, I always think about that whenever anybody, it has nothing to do with yeah. it. Neither here nor there. But right? I also think it also doesn't help with the whole concept that the, the only time something is justifiable is if you're going to get X amount of views. Yeah. Because this stuff that we made growing up and the stuff that I mean, there's also plenty of stuff now that it's just never, it doesn't get views, but it's the process of making totally. it and like learning something. Like I did this yeah. little archival thing and we put like uh, UFOs in it and like it didn't get any views, but it really wasn't yeah. about that. It was about like playing around with archival footage and putting totally. a 3D thing in that. And so that's also missing because it's just like, do I have a platform to release this to? How many people are going to... Whereas growing up, it was just like, we just made stuff. Yeah, even when I was working in Alienware doing video production professionally, I made a ton of stuff that I was just trying things, you know, little funny sketches or little VFX moments or little conceptual moments, and I never put it online anywhere. Yeah. I showed maybe friends. Yeah. And then when you're younger, your audience is the people that helped make it and your parents. For sure. <laughs> so it's like... I think that thought process needs to come back. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, it's that thought process is inherent in anybody who's passionate enough and they're just going to do that regardless and then it's nothing we need to worry or think about. Yeah. I don't know. But I do have a question. Say if I'm 15 and I want to be an editor. Yeah. Because I don't. I have a few opinions on this and I've, I've given advice to some people, but I'm not an editor. But they have no footage. They have no desire to shoot. They have no camera. But yeah. they do have, say, Premiere or right. hit film, whatever. Yeah. What would be a good way to start, like, practicing and honing that craft? I mean, there, there, I feel like there's a bunch of ways about it. Something that I had always done and I still always do, it's a lot easier now with archival sites that just put up a ton of archival footage, but you can make, and it's definitely good practices to just start cutting seemingly disconnected footage and attempting to make some kind of narrative through line, whether that's like, like I did one thing where I, you, you rip a section of like War of the Worlds from the radio play or whatever, and then you just cut stuff to it yeah, and things like that. And so there's like a ton of footage out there that's free to grab and a lot of that archival stuff. So just getting into the software, having a narrative approach to something, having a concept of like, this is what I want this to say, and then 
looking for the footage to do that has been something that's helped me. I also cut a lot of that stuff to like poetry as well. It's like a whole. I think that's thing. so much better too than like, you know, a lot of people will cut their own trailers or recut trailers to do trailer mashups, which are cool and great and useful, I think, as far as learning how to cut and why and when and pacing and all that. But I don't think it's super useful to help you get jobs. Yeah. Whereas no. like if somebody took a ton of archival footage and yeah. crafted something that wasn't, yeah, that would be impressive to me. I mean, you can, there's a lot of even like title sequences out there yeah. that are based around archival footage. Like it's a really rad vibe that you can get. And there's like archival footage that I had played around with and cut that all of a sudden popped up on the last Godzilla title sequence. And they just put Godzilla in the water. And it right. was just like all this old archival atomic bomb footage, but they put Godzilla in there. And all of a sudden it's like, so there's a lot of stuff that has a lot of commercial viability and creative viability that you can create from archival material but then you can also like kind of turn that into reaching out to people who are at your similar level either a little bit below or a little bit above you and saying this is some stuff that i've created i love to edit even if you're going to end up uploading your own cut like i would love to take a stab at cutting it yeah is that something you'd be down with and you might be surprised how many people especially if you say if you just want to upload your cut that's fine i just want practice i'm not gonna necessarily upload it on my you know just to get practice and then if you blow them out of the water you nail a cut that go with yours, like now you're in it because now you have yeah. something. It's like you have to prove yourself. You have to like, you know, put something behind you before anybody else will. So it's like going out and getting that stuff and creating things somehow. Like no one's going to be like, sure, you can edit my piece just because you say yeah, you can. For you got to sure. show you can. And that is true at the beginning and at the end. Like Totally. You have never cut a car commercial. Are you sure you can cut it? Uh huh. You've never cut sports. Are you sure you can cut sports? Yeah, you've e- never even cut looking horror, for you, you've, ne- you know. you've never cut action. But that uh, football piece, uh, five yeah. star, you did with Booth was cut like action. And if it wasn't for that, I don't know. I would have had the balls to give it a shot. Right. But you did cut something that looked like action. So you're completely capable, obviously, mm-hmm. of it. But if you had not done that to show it, because we didn't know each other yet. And you're going to be constantly having to prove yourself because in studio worlds, I'm assuming, or with larger budget and feature world and stuff like that, it's going to constantly be like, well, you've never cut a film exactly like this film. Are you sure you can do that? Well, yeah, like I've even dealt, you know, I assume you deal with that in every you know aspect of it and i've dealt with that plenty like the meetings i have had so it's like so you just want to do comedy it's like no i don't want to do comedy at all right like film rights comedy and i enjoy doing it Mm -hmm. but none of my feature ideas are comedic none of them yeah sometimes we do sketches that are comedic and you know the reason that we do those is you know blood tober i just thought it was funny like it was a funny punchline but i would have rather have done like the serious route of horror but we had sponsors attached and you know sponsors usually shy away from things like horror, mm-hmm. anything that might have gore in it like that or be of that tempo, they're you know not super keen to jump yeah. on board with. But the second I said, but it's comedic, it's all a punchline, there's a joke to it, they were like, oh, oh yeah, oh, totally. oh okay. Yeah, yeah. So knowing that, you know, I went the comedic route, that way I could still play in the horror like genre and do some fun stuff I wanted to do, but still be able to actually get a budget behind yeah. it and do the things that we wanted to do overall. Because, you know, like I've said before, all my short films are they're strategic. Like every one that I do, it's something I want to make, sure, but it's also like a notch on my belt Mm -hmm. that's like, I haven't done this before. Now I have. Yeah. Um, Just trying to build that experience that I'm telling everybody else that they need to build leading toward that feature. You like build your own experience personally as a filmmaker, as an editor, as a director, but then you're also building your experience to combat people who say, well, have you ever done something like this? Because if you have, it's like, yes, actually I have. Yeah. You're like, oh. Yeah. And it's funny. It's like even Ballistic is out now by the time we release this, but it's currently not out we just yeah. locked the cut yeah um while we we're recording this but um you know there's there's a, a part of me that is afraid of because some of the treatments i have ready to go are horror films and that's something that i want to make it's not it's more like you know six sensey type yeah. you know drama scary but ballistic is action hmm. so it's like you know a part of me is like man am i going to be pegged into this action corner because that's what i'm putting out yeah. or are they going to be like oh no you know this i mean i have told a show for myself i have like the vibes of like Bloodtober. Right. And some vibes, I mean, in Ballistic. Like Yeah, for sure. Like in the, the, house the living and, room. Yeah, and, for yeah. sure. But yeah, it's definitely something that you have to constantly be aware of is like what you're putting out because you don't want to get pegged and right. pushed into a hole. Or maybe you do. I don't yeah. know. I mean, that is one reason that I've like consciously tried to do different, all the different genres I yeah. want to do eventually. Mm-hmm. Just do like 
little sketches or shorts on so I can see like, no, like this is in my vocabulary. This is the type of stuff I want to do. Yeah. Uh, to be able to fall back on, be like, oh, watch this one, watch this one. Right. So to have the gamut of everything that I want to do instead of just popping out this one, yeah. you know, genre. I mean, how do you think people used to do it though? I mean, I guess in some ways they would all, I'm, I'm talking back in like the eighties, nineties, the filmmakers coming up then. I think about that often is like, yeah. how did editors come up in that world? How did directors come up in that world? I mean, was just pigeonholing directors is much more of a thing back then yeah i mean i that's what i've i mean obviously i don't know yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> but from well. what i've heard yeah it's like people definitely got pegged i mean they get pegged now for things and you know i know of some directors that wanted to break out of the genre so they did make a short film and it was like hey look yeah. and this was a director that was you know already making things that mm-hmm. were going to the theaters and were successful so i imagine like before it was even way worse uh especially if you if you get pegged as comedy like breaking yeah. out of that has to be super hard i mean obviously talking out of my ass here a little bit but you know that's got to be super hard but anyway we're off on a totally strange tangent but that's but that's fine so you've done a lot of commercial work yeah so i'm curious how different is like the commercial process versus because i haven't done a high-end commercial personally so how different is that process versus like a narrative process like ballistic or uh the film you did with booth the heights yeah the heights yeah 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 it's super it's it's a different approach. It's a different atmosphere, vibe, timeline. I mean, commercial, I am mostly working with like the creative director on the agency side and the writer and the creative director. It's not. Which, if somebody doesn't know, explain the creative director position. I mean, so the post house, the production and post house that I'm at, we do all the production and post. <laughs> you couldn't guess Uh, (laughs) but we don't work directly with the end brands like we work with agencies who's creating these marketing campaigns and then pitching them to anheuser-busch or enterprise or whatever so they're pitching them these campaigns to the end client but then they're in charge of writing concepting spots and web content and ads of all kinds and then they come to us the production of post house and say there's like a whole pitch process that happens. I'll just kind of not even get into that. But essentially the ad company, the agency comes to the production and says, this is the concept of the commercial we want. What would be your take? You pitch your take, you get the commercial, and then you're working with the director is working in tandem with the creative director who is in charge of that brand for the year or whatever and comes up and really fleshes out how this spot will be. So a creative director is really like, Kind of like a showrunner. Yeah, kind of. And they have their hands in the 60-second commercial, but they also have their hands in the YouTube pre-roll and also have their hands in the billboards, just kind of everything. So, yeah, they're kind of like the overlord of this marketing campaign for this brand. And so once it gets into the edit room, and it really depends, but generally I have a little bit of time with the director to like cut this was the vision from the outset. But then at some point, it kind of all gets handed off to the agency and I don't really work with the director much anymore other than, you know, sending cuts to like keep them in the loop and to keep them understanding of what's going on. But the creative director kind of becomes the gatekeeper and they're the main conduit who's then taking the cut and going to the client and getting. So you're just working with somebody completely different with a completely different approach, different sensibilities, not to mention storytelling in a 60 second is vastly different than a 60 yeah. minute. Right. Where commercial is as clear communication as humanly possible from frame one to the end, to frame 60 or whatever. You know, it's just like constant, clear communication. You can't hold anything back. There's not a lot of subtext. I mean, there's some commercials you can point to that do have some of that subtext and things like that. But by and large, it's like as on the nose as you can be because you're communicating the brand's identity. And so it's just a different approach. And so for me personally, like I'm working with a director, I'm working with a creative director, I'm getting boards that they've had animatics that they may have had animated and cut. I'm getting all of this information and then kind of delivering as boarded, not as much as scripted, but as boarded, here's the spot. Here's where I think we can inject some excitement. Here's where I think we can get a little stylistic. Here's where I think we can polish this idea. And so I definitely have some like creative input. But a lot of times it's like executing on the board. There are some commercials that come where it's just like they want to go very editorially heavy and just like really stylized, quick cuts, all of this stuff. But usually 
it's more in the as boarded and then polish. Right. Versus what is a, like a narrative process for you? I mean, narrative process is all script based as far as rather than cutting as boarded, cutting a version that's as scripted. It's a lot more direct communication with the director. Um, like with you, I mean, we have had a lot of conversation, a lot of communication. You've been sitting like with me and we've been cutting and working constantly on crafting the story and like building more subtext, building a deeper storyline, polishing the areas of the story that are interesting, and then maybe like not polishing the areas that we want to kind of hide, you know? So there's a lot more like collaborative cutting that happens in narrative that yeah. doesn't really exist in advertisement. I assume you prefer narrative? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's where I am at now as far... It doesn't pay as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We don't care. I don't care. The company maker. <laughs> uh, for me, the narrative is definitely the end game for everything. I yeah. guess narrative, and I'm also documentary. I really love cutting documentary. Um, but, you know, long form doc and narrative work is squarely where I want to be because I do like investing in a project longer term. I do love subtext. I do love crafting and shaping an experience, which may be a little bit controversial, but there's not a lot of experience you can craft in a 60 second ad. Yeah. Like I mean, it's just the, the nature of it. Yeah. I mean, it's 60 seconds, so you can't yeah. really invest. Like you can't, I mean, it's like, a, you know, series versus a film. You can invest yeah. way more into a character with a series than you can with yeah. a film, but you know, it's nothing on the film. It's just the nature of it. I have X amount of episodes and way more hours to invest yeah. in this character. So you can do a lot more. And you can impact a lot more if something bad happens to that character. It's just how it is. Yeah. So I just like creating atmospheres, environments, experiences yeah. for an audience. Mm -hmm. Like that's where I want to be. And that's like what I want to be doing. Totally. I think commercial is completely via Like it's, it's its own thing. It's great. And it is fun to cut commercials. Oh, yeah. But in a perfect world, it would be film 80%, 90%. 10 to 20 percent advertisement okay so shifting into holistic and us working together on this film is out so we can say whatever we want now yeah we can first of all i had you on set mm -hmm. what was that process like how is that useful did you like doing that would you want to do that more and and what was the main benefit for you as an editor for being on set yeah i, I do like being on set there's a lot of conversation in some editing circles about not being on set um, because you don't want to be tainted by the difficulty of shot A versus shot B or cutting this, cutting that, things things like this. And so sort of the it's kind of sort of the same process as a director has, you know, yeah. going into the edit suite is, you know, I, sure. I did all the shots. I, I'm in love with some of the shots. Yeah. I, I had the initial intention in my head and now we got to break that and make a new one. Yep. But I, I don't find that that's true with me so far. Like I haven't really run into anything where I've been consciously or subconsciously maintaining a shot because everybody on set loved it in the moment yeah i mean we've killed a lot of babies already which is yeah. a, we gotta come up with a new phrase it's such a horrible phrase it is horrible. but uh i i don't i probably did early on but i definitely don't have a problem now breaking things apart and turning it into a new thing yeah so i don't see why you would yeah for sure and like it's my job to not Right, get attached to things right. and to attempt to remain. I mean, no, you, nobody ever really remains objective through the entire mm -hmm. process. So for me, it's like understanding the intention of shots is really helpful. And you get that from being on set. Uh, I guess, you know, is it helpful for you? I mean, because that at the end of the day, I want to serve the film, serve the director and to create the best film it could possibly be. And so, I mean, a lot of my worries or concerns was like, is this helpful for the process and the project overall? And right. is this helpful for, for you? Well, I mean, it, you know, we're definitely on an indie scale. So, I mean, we're talking about it from that end. But yeah. so from the indie scale as a whole, it was nice to know that you were the bodyguard of the footage, making mm -hmm. sure everything was okay, making sure we had it and it was backed up properly, yeah. which is nice to have because it's yeah. somebody who cares about the footage as much as I do. Right. But beyond that, if it wasn't, you know, just as indie as it was, especially when we shot in Texas because mm -hmm. you were doing, you know, the DIT stuff yeah. in Texas, just having you there behind the monitor, having my back almost as a script soup in some ways, but, you know, more than that of, you know, I had to throw out the shot list and now I'm just making things up as I go along. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I got the coverage we need. Then I could just look over and go, right. And then you give me the thumbs up. We're good to go. Yeah. Or I have to make, you know, this big switch because nothing's working. We only have an hour left with Cambry. You know, the, the original intention of how I was going to do this was going to be facing this way. And 
I'm literally flipping everything upside down and having to piece that now together in my head, throw out the old idea and edit together this new idea in my head and play it back, being able to turn to you and go, hey, if I get this shot and this shot, we can make that work, yes? Yeah. And then, you know, having that backup was huge for me, especially with a project like this Yeah, that was moving so fast. Yeah. You know, we needed four times the budget that we actually had to pull it off, but we did pull it off. So there's a lot of stress and restraints that go along with it. So having that backup was was huge for me. It's like I called you, know, you and Chase, I called you, uh, us three, the Triforce. Yeah, totally. Because it was like, yeah. you know, every time we had lunch or dinner or anything, it was like the Triforce came together. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, okay, here's where we're at. Here's what we still need. There's no way we're getting that. So how so do we get, what? you know, how do yeah, we get this? For sure. Which is what I'm always talking about. The original intention, what I was setting out to do. Yeah. How do we accomplish what the story is setting out to do? Not in this original way, the the ambitious way that I came in with. We yeah. have to break that down. We have to water that down a little bit. But how do we water it down and it still tastes delicious? Yeah, for sure. And it, then it's like, well, it's up to you in the beginning to cast your vision properly to your collaborators so that when things do need to be a little bit more free form, everybody is on the same page with the end goal. Yeah. And then you can go off script and you can improvise your way through this because everybody has been bought into your vision and you've communicated it properly to your keys. I mean, you know, you're not going to communicate your entire vision to everybody up and down, but to your keys so that you can in a time of crisis for lack of a better word turn and be like is this gonna work yeah totally yeah. or if you guys are seeing something like veering off and like hey you know just notice this just you know as a reminder because especially when doing action it's so chaotic there's for so sure. many things flying it's easy to uh lose track of a, a thing or two and that's where you know people like you chase producers stuff like that mm -hmm. come really useful but i really liked having you a part of the process even before that like when we me and chase had our meetings for the day you were always involved and i really liked having that because it makes sense to me it's like if you're yeah. gonna be cutting the film you know it's like i've been saying you're one of the writers there's four writers the writer the director the cinematographer and the editor mm -hmm. i'm two of the four and you know so we had all four writers in the room you know yeah. chase has helped writing it visually you're doing the actual final rewrite with me in the end yeah so it's like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to bring you in in the final hour when yeah. you can't give any input on something that could be physically altered. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense to like do this now. Yeah. So and I, like, I, hey, you might need this or that. It feels like that's the way this new age is kind of tended. Is, it, is, it, is that happening more? Yeah. I mean, you saw it in an extreme example on like Baby Driver where they had a video feed that was going directly to an, the editor who was on set, oh, a wow. completely tricked out station. And he was getting proxy in real time as they were shooting and recording. <laughs> I didn't and know that. Yeah, and then he would cut, and then Edgar would look over and be like, he would give him, you know, two minutes to cut these four shots that they just got. Because it was so syncopated, especially the beginning of the so film. They were, so they were cutting real time? Yeah, and he would look that's over insane. and be like, is that going to work? They did and be it. like, that's going to work, and like, let's move on. Or it'd be like, nope, we need to hit that again because it was a little quick, you know, this, that, right. or the other thing. And so, but there was a huge technical back end to <laughs> making that work. There's no card handing off, right. downloading, ingesting, syncing, you know what I mean? It was, he was getting a live feed to his machine that was recording an automatic, you know, so oh, with that, it was like, it almost feels like the fullest extent of an editor being on set because they are a behind the monitor, keeping story eyes on everything. And then B in a film as complicated as baby driver doing really quick cuts, nothing that would probably ever have been kept. Yeah. But just, are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? We're good. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah. And I know like a lot of editors, especially with bigger films are, are cutting while the film is happening, but they're cutting in the production office. Yeah. While they're the near happening. set, not on yeah. set. And the director will go at the end of the day. And um, I mean, I like the idea of that too, because yeah. you're catching things as you go, but just having you on set for that extra input, I really loved. So I don't yeah. know which one Divided. I'd rather. I mean, it's also. Maybe we'll try that with the next one. Yeah. See. Well, there's also a huge difference between short and feature in yeah. that world because in the case of ballistic it's not like i could cut through the day and then in the evening you stop and be like are we good be like oh no we actually need to pick up these shots well tough shit like <laughs> yeah we can't well we don't have money so no if you're on a 30 day shoot 20 day shoot whatever you, yeah, can. you can push things and yeah, yeah. you can well we'll put that in a pickup day we'll go back and grab it tomorrow we'll save an hour 
sometime during the day to schedule the pickups that we need, you know? And so yeah, and and like, it's understood that those things are going to happen for too. sure. So it's like in feature world, it might make more sense to be cutting near set to essentially review dailies like they used to do back in the day, but yeah. it's more like sequences, skim some footage, have 45 minutes to talk about things. I could see that working for feature that will probably never work for a short just because there's no time. It needs to be real time communication because we can't go back. Yeah. It's like once we move this light, this shot is done forever. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, because it's like, you know, in, in short film world, at least in mine, especially with how we're always doing it, because mm-hmm. I always try to fit everything in a very tiny box. It's For like sure. a $10 box when I needed a $100 box. It's like we have exactly this many hours, yeah. period. There's yeah. no going over. There's no, especially this time we had a child actor. Mm-hmm. So she's hard out 1230. So when we yeah. did the night stuff, we had that much time period yeah and Doesn't that was matter. just a legal thing yeah. there was no there was no conversation to be had Twelve thirty, you are done yeah it was just the exact same thing for the heights booth film i was on set for that one as well and it was originally talked about as far as like quickly cutting some things and seeing mm-hmm. how things were going and about an hour into the first day i was like this is not gonna work yeah and so then i just bailed on that I did the dit work and then I came down and was behind the monitor. And yeah. that's that. There's just no time to cut on a short. Yeah, very different. So you have the footage, you come back to St. Louis. I'm in Texas. Mm-hmm. Now what? Drink? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> well, we had a ton of footage because we had, yeah, we did. How many cameras did we have? I always forget. I mean, we had eight inactive cameras. Total. Uh, yeah, yeah, total. I think at any given time we had at least two shooting and on the action bits it was like six or seven cameras rolling yeah i think we only rolled eight twice yeah and then yeah we rolled like on six all at once often yeah. when we were in la mm-hmm. and then i think in la it was pretty much always three cameras except the last day the last day we stripped yeah, down to two right but we went single cam a lot on the, but last the first day too. three days was yeah, three minimum three yeah, it was pretty rare when we, when I wasn't rolling on three. It was like when we were in the follow car, which was that motorcycle with the with the cage mm. on the side of it, so we could get all the some of the follow running, mostly just the driving stuff. That was all. Oh no, we were running three camera on that. Yeah, we were because uh, we had just, two only on the, the open. Cart. The opening shot was two cameras only. Yeah, but the bad guy approach. That was three because we had one. Oh no, that was, like, was four. like four or five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just had all the angles. It's like, hey, do we have another camera? Yes, set it up. Well, we only had okay, so we had. What, two hours to shoot it all, max. Yeah. Max. And on top of that, they were rental cars. And <laughs> I was, I was, yeah. I mean, Tim will find this out now if he, if he listens to this, but Tim was going to the stunt guys going, hey, these are rentals, go easy. And then yeah. Tim walked away and I walked up to the stunt guys and I was like, do not go easy. <laughs> You take these things to task, man. I want these things sideways. <laughs> yeah, totally. They did, man. And they did. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I didn't want to do it too many times because yeah. I am asking them to like get these things like full on sideways yeah. if they can. And they are rental cars. Yeah. So I'm not looking to pay for those freaking things. Yeah, for sure. That would be my company coming out of pocket for that. Yep. So I was just trying to do it as, yeah. as minimal as, as possible. As much coverage and yeah, the totally. least amount of takes. And that's also the same for a lot of the stunts because it's mm-hmm. like you can't continuously light a guy on fire. Yeah. You have two times and uh, that's You know what's it. interesting, speaking of the stunt stuff, is uh, we got, which this was amazing because this is the first time where it was like, I show up and I'm like, man, it would be nice if I could have that on fire. Oh, we you want that it. on fire? We yeah, can do it. Yeah. We'll set it on fire. <laughs> it's on fire. So we, we get there for <laughs> we the tech recording. scout and uh, my stunt coordinator, Josh Tessier, he's like... Like any idea that pops in your head, you just let me know. We could probably make it happen. First idea out of my mouth, he's like, no, Ryan. <laughs> Are you insane? No. And I'm like, well, you said. And he's hilarious. like, no. Well, I mean, we could do it, but it's going to cost you an extra thousand because it's like stunt guy shows up to do X gag that you plan for for X amount of money. And you're like, hey, I kind of also want to put you through the front windshield of this car here. Yeah. And he's like, okay, totally. I'll do it for an extra grand. Yeah. I forget what they called it. Um uh, I don't it's like when it's they called. charge you a little bit extra because right. of the danger of them dying. Yeah, to- totally. <laughs> like the, the danger of pain is much higher. And like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll do it. I'll take the bat to the face, but you're going to pay me for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which makes all the sense in the world. Totally. But it was just funny that the first thing out of my mouth was like, like are uh, you? No, no, man. No, we don't have Ryan, the budget for Ryan, that. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. Like we can't just we can't just throw them through the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> How quickly we grow to the size of our yeah. container. You said You're anything? Like a goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> totally. Uh, but it's, a, and, and, and all that's scary too, because it's like, I mean, I trust Josh completely. Yeah. So I, I trust mean, him to. too. Yeah. And that's I, an interesting relationship. It is it, because it's like, it's my set. This is my crew. These are all these people showing up to make my film, my vision. So there, with that comes this huge, like not just gratitude for everybody just being there. I just yeah. always feel like, thank you. God, thank you for yeah, being here. Right. But just this huge sense of responsibility for everybody's well-being yeah. overall. Not just even with the project as a whole. Like I'm so stressed that all these people are here. They're sweating with me. They're spending all this time with me, working their ass off with me. Mm-hmm. I got to make sure this is right. I got to yeah. make sure this is good. So I'm there to like have the correct answer for things. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's that stress. But on top of that, just their physical well-being. Especially with not... stunts and blowing Exactly. Like up. even the actress doing something as simple as like, a very simple little prat fall to the ground yeah she could easily twist an ankle she could easily fall and you know not to mention the glass that was everywhere the glass that was everywhere the rocks all over the floor so it's it's really scary to because then it's this balance of well we can't go soft with this thing we can't go 90 percent. we got to go 100 percent. otherwise we're wasting everyone's time you know i'm not making the right choices to you know the well-being of the project which is everybody's final well-being but then you're also juggling that with what's most important and that safety. Yeah. So that's, that's a scary thing. And, you know, I totally trusted Josh. I worked with him before and he's a complete and total pro that's been doing this forever. So that was really nice. So it was very nice. It's, you know, you have somebody that you can trust that when I'm pushing it too far, he goes, okay, stop. We need to rope that back. Mm -hmm. That's not safe. We're not doing that. But I know he's not being picky either. I know he's not being like just safety police to be so, because he doesn't want to do it. He wants to go further than I do. So he's there just to be like, "Mm, maybe not that. How about if we do it this way and then he'll find a safer way a correct way to do it i'm like beautiful yeah so that takes a lot of stress off my plate yeah because i know safety is his number one goal Mm -hmm. and he's very responsible and attentive to that so that was an interesting thing overall so it's it's just weird when you're asking these guys hey i want you to be ripped by a wire 12 feet in the air and then fall full force down to the ground you can't have mats yeah you have to land on the rocks that's crazy and they just have these tiny pads yeah and it's just every time without fail the gag goes off and I call cut and I just sit there going, please be okay. <laughs> please get up. Please get yeah. up. And then please the guys go up and they check them and they're okay. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Yeah. That's okay, crazy. on to the next one. It's so stressful. Yeah. Super. Because it's just like, oh man, just the worst possible thing is somebody getting hurt yeah. because of some stupid thing that I wrote that doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, in the long in, in the long scheme of things, yeah. someone's well being is far more important than this. this stupid thing I wrote. Yeah. Even though, you know, to me this thing is my child. I mean, I yeah, love it, but I mean but everybody this is also more important. I mean every Everybody is also there to give their all for the film, yeah. usually. And if everybody's on the same page, they're willing to go the distance to make right. the film what it needs to be. Exactly. And that's the stressful part. Yeah. Because if like the stuntmen are in it 1000% and they just want to give everything they possibly can, I got to make sure they're not going too far. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, totally. Especially when we did stuff like proximity or stuff like that, when you don't have a stunt coordinator, but mm-hmm. you're still trying to push it far to get something special, like that mud fight scene. Right. You know, those guys were willing to, you know, do whatever yeah. for, for the project. We were all just so passionate to get in there and do that thing together. So it was such a stressful thing for me to, okay, nope. We're done with that. Let's yeah. move on. That's fine. You know what? Let's do it this way instead. Totally. It's just really stressful. I mean, does the uh, does, does the stress of finishing well carry th- all the way through post, all the way to the release of the film? I mean, you just want to like... Yeah. Because you're still, you're still my director after the film comes. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, totally. Yeah. Down to like, what's the best way to release it? What's the best day exactly. to release it? Okay, yeah. okay, it's definitely going on YouTube. What's the best day to release it? Right. What's the best time to release yeah. it? Can I get it to blogs? How do I get it to blogs? Yeah. How do I make sure this gets eyes on it so that everybody's you know proud of this accomplishment, but also people are seeing their accomplishment? You know, the stress never goes away. Yeah, and then and then, and then the comments begin. Yeah, right. And you're just like, ugh, which is like. We talk about it all the time, but it's just funny that it's like a thousand great comments and one bad one. Yeah. <laughs> and then it cuts way you, it's, deeper. Yeah, and th- well, then it's just in your mind, it's a thousand bad comments and one good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's just flips. But that's just everybody that's experiences that one. Yeah, it's just totally. the nature of it. Luckily, I have a pretty thick skin now. But yeah, the, the stress is throughout, especially like cutting it, man. Something yeah. like Sentinel, it's so tight and contained that I literally shot the edit. Mm-hmm. I think there might be two shots that I didn't use in oh, that wow. entire thing, yeah. you know, 
Whereas something like ballistic, this is something longer, there's options. Yeah. It's a totally different thing. So it's For like, sure. as we're crafting this together, I'm just so stressed that we're trying something we shouldn't be trying, that we mm-hmm. should go backwards, and that's muddying the waters for us now when we're not seeing clearly anymore, mm-hmm. or we're taking too many notes, or you know we're not going far enough. There's right. something we're missing. There's an avenue that we could go down that would make all this stuff perfect. Right. You know, it's like, are we finishing the perfect version of this film, or are we just finishing a version of the film? Yeah. I or mean, is that even a thing? Yeah. I, I mean, it doesn't seem like there's a thing that this is a this is the only perfect version of this film. Sure. So I think. And I mean, I've never directed anything. I've never written anything that's ended up on screen or anything like that. But for me, from my standpoint, when I'm cutting, it feels like the film is taking shape on its own. And it's like the film is greater than the sum of its parts, Mm -hmm. greater than the director, greater than the writer, greater than the cinematographer, greater than the like, it's the combination of all of these parts that create something greater than the sum of its parts. And so it seems like and from the editorial standpoint, and like our experience with ballistic, it seems like we were attempting to find the true nature of the film. And like, what is this film want to be? Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it all falls into place. And it's like the 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 more obvious structure, it falls right into place. And right. it's like, yes, this, but the nature with any film, there's like issues that you now right. have to solve, you know, stuff that on the day you knew was a problem, but there's nothing you could do about it. You know, it's like, we literally have one hour to get three hours worth of right. stuff. So we just have to get it. Yeah. And we're going to have to figure this out later because we can't do reshoots. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's those things. And that's, I think, where my worry comes into play. Like, you know, stuff like the living room scene or a right. lot of the action bits, it's like, this was shot how I wanted. Mm-hmm. Well, even in the living room, we ran out of time and there were some, some corners that needed to be yeah. cut, unfortunately. But you, so you have little pockets that... Yeah, this was shot exactly how I wanted and envisioned, and mm-hmm. this is how it should go together. Boom. There you go. And that's often the right way. Yeah. Or, you know, it's easy to craft that differently. It's the stuff where it's like, okay, we had to shift gears hard. How do we make this work still? Like I said before, to that original intention. Yeah. And even a lot of the stuff that was shot, essentially edited as shot or shot as edited, you start to see emotional undertones that you can polish Mm -hmm. just by holding on this look a little bit longer yeah, or cutting this line a little short or having Isaac interrupt Sam and her, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. You start to create, you know what? Don't let him finish his sentence. Exactly. And that, that stuff is super fun Mm -hmm. because, and then that's when these characters start to become human. Yeah. And that's when you believe them. Yeah. Oh, you know what? She doesn't need to say that twice. Just cut into the second time. Exactly. One of the things I thought was really interesting with this one was the flashbacks were not scripted. Um, like those little pain flashes. The pain flashes. Yeah. The quick the quick flash flashbacks. Right. Like at the end when all the flashbacks with Cambry and Rachel and Mark, those were all scripted. The, mm-hmm. the narrative flashbacks where we go and we live in a scene, that was all scripted. The bedroom, right. all that was scripted. But that quick stylistic stuff was not in the script. But as we were editing the action piece, because we shot in LA and we edited the action piece first and we got all that done and that was nice. And we were going through the um, scene 12, which is when Omid is, you know, constantly, constantly hitting, hitting the wrong Dana, numbers. Yeah. yeah. So to get her numbers down and ultimately is going to kill her through it. She's having these, these moments of this impact. And we both were feeling it like, man, we're going to go from this emotional stuff into this and this is just brute force and I'm not feeling the emotional impact of this and everything that we've gone through should culminate here and should all weigh on her. And then we came up with the idea of every time you hit it, she's like flashing, remembering what we just showed. Yeah. But we knew it couldn't be just straight shots. That would be, it would feel like last time on. Yeah, exactly. You could do some of it, but it needed to be subjective. It needed to be her subjective memory of it and switching from her remembering it wrong. Like even in there, you, you had the great find and like of having Rachel say no Dana. Yeah. And right. stuff like that to where it's like not quite right until we get into her remember the truth mm-hmm. of what her mom did and yeah. what her mom thought of her and was really telling her and all that. So we found that in the first bit of editing. So when we shot the next bit in Texas, we just we picked up a ton of stuff. Yeah, threw a camera at you and Josh and you guys just got tons of stuff and mm-hmm. that that totally helped us find the correct way into the bedroom. Right. Because we both felt like the bedroom was like, it was, it was good, but mm-hmm. it was like wrong. There was an emotional tone that we wanted to hit with the cut that we wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's like, even, you know, we could have hit the emotional tone without the flashes, mm-hmm. but it just brick walled the pacing yeah. and it wasn't time to slow down 
Like we needed to sort of move our way in because it starts with action and movement and yeah. it's violent and mysterious. And we just stopped mm -hmm. and had a moment when it needed to like, so the flashes mm -hmm. helped us do that. Yeah. We actually had a whole version of flashes. Very, very flashy. Which like kind of sucked the heart out of it. Yeah. But we had discovered a ton of stuff in the process yeah. of cutting that version. Including the, how we did the ending. Yeah, totally. So there, the, we did, we did a fair bit of exploring, not because the narrative or the intention or the point was lost in any way, but we did a ton of exploring because it's like, how far can we push this concept? And right. what are the things that we are going to discover that's going to inform the narrative yeah. that was originally intended? Yeah, because it's like the idea is, you know, life is shit. Yeah. All you have is to keep going, to keep moving, sure. and to find those reasons to keep moving, and to explore the reason why is she still going? What yeah. gives her her drive? What is it that gives any of us our drive when day-to-day -day things are garbage, but you just keep going anyway, and that's really what you have, and... I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's a simplified version of it. You know, so it's like, how do we pull that to the top? While also, because there's that three layer of meaning there for yeah. me. There's the above ground, just what it's about if you just straight watch it. Oh, this is a girl's survival story. Then there's the next layer of what it's about, which is basically keep moving. And then there's the next layer of what it's about, which I'll never say out loud, which yeah. I always have with my stuff like tell and... And if you get stuff from it, great. If you don't, well, that was for me. It helped me write the story and tell right. the story. And it means something for to me. sure. So it was, I mean, you know what it is. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, so it's like, you know, how do we flush out all of those things? Yeah. How do we make all of those things shine? And, you know, I'm, and in the end, it's like, I'm not willing to strip away any of those intentions, any right. of those three layers of intention. For yeah. And you shouldn't. And that's what makes interesting film, I think, is right. a deep subtext and layers to things. That's what makes things rewatchable. And like I saw A Quiet Place again, and it was like... Oh, so good. It was like better so the good. second time. Cause I need to see it again. That film, you could second watch, third watch, fourth watch. I mean, there's just so much so deep. There's the, the surface layer story, which is awesome and like super engaging and mm -hmm. intense. And then there's like you peel back layer after layer. Yeah layer after layer of the story and it's just like constant discovery every watch you do i'm imagining you're seeing something different that was intended you know what i mean yeah those are the types of films that i'm interested in cutting yeah that's and that's my favorite stuff too i mean who knows we'll find out soon enough but hopefully ballistic does that for at least somebody yeah that they're still thinking about it and what did this mean what did that mean for what sure. was this saying that that it worked for them on that level mm -hmm. hopefully i mean you know that's the hope i mean if if nothing else hopefully people watch it and are entertained by it but I mean, yeah. the, you know, the winner, the prize is if people are picking up, not even like fully like, oh, this is what it's about, but they're, they're pulling away something from it yeah. because my idea is always, I don't want to be like, Hey, here you go. Here's the theme. There you go. You're welcome. Bye. Yeah. Or here's a message. There you go. I want to, uh, like I said to someone recently is, you know, I want to paint the canvas and leave some room there for you to bring your brush to it and to your paint to it. And conversation. It yeah. Starts that. Yeah. Cause that's my favorite films is, you know, I don't know what the director was fully trying to say, but mm -hmm. this is what I got from it. Cause I'm bringing my own experiences yeah. to it. So that's really the hope. And it's like, that's one of the biggest stresses for me. Like, oh, yeah. did, did, it, did it work? Am yeah, I, right. You know, am I saying too much? Am I saying too little? And yeah. I definitely have a problem with that often <laughs> where I just don't give much information. Yeah. I have like this weird with short films. I mean, my feature ideas don't do it as much. <laughs> no, they um, don't. <laughs> but I have, I have like this thing with short films where it's like, what do I, I don't need to tell you what's going on here. Yeah. Figure it out. You know, yeah. you know, for better or worse. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people complain about it often. Like yeah. with Sentinel proximity definitely got some complaints on that, yeah. <laughs> but not as much. You don't have time or the energy and within the short to spend on right. that kind of thing. Right. And it's like, it's just unimportant to me. Like for me, it's more, what am I trying to say? Or what is if in the, you know, somewhere that's comedic, like ghost house, what's the punchline? You know, what, is, what is it that, what's the experience I'm trying to give the audience? And that's what I'm focusing on. Really? Yeah, totally. What do you think of that? <laughs> I think well of that. I think the thing that's most interesting, cause like everything we just talked about, everything we just laid out is a pretty specific Essentially, what I'm slowly going to get to the question of is like, you've never used an editor 
And like, yeah, I mean, how has that process been for you? It's been great. Okay, I, we can I stop love there. It. We'll I stop love there. It. Thank you for tuning in to yeah. <laughs> one of my my good friends, uh, whose opinion I really respect, and I've said this a bunch, has been telling me for years now, you need to get an editor, you need to get an editor. But I've just been so terrified about trying to get one because it's like getting a writer, you know, yeah. or somebody to write with, and you know, that's never worked out for me, and or a co director in a way. Right. Um, it's it's kind of a little bit of both of those things and it's like i've always edited my own thing and it's you know always finding ways to make things work when they're not working and it's just so terrifying to me to try to bring someone in and it's like but then what if it just gets to the point where i have to be like move yeah. let me just do it just right. stop stop touching uh so i've i've steered away from it because i've also i just haven't been able to find somebody yeah. until now and then like I said earlier, I saw your stuff from Booth, mm-hmm. and I was like, hey. So I've been wanting to for a really long time because yeah. my friend has been hounding me to do it. So, <laughs> so I was Good like, okay, them. I'm going to do it. Because he's like, I'm telling you, man, you'll never want to edit your stuff again. And I'm like, I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to edit my own stuff. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to edit my own <laughs> stuff. It's just so great. I mean, I'll probably, like, you know, you send me project files every now and again, and mm-hmm. I would do little things just to be like, hey, this is what I meant. Yep. But they were like tiny little moments. It was like, right. this is what I mean by that cut. You yeah. know, not like I'm not cutting a scene. And it just allowed me to step back from the technical, step back For from sure. the controls and just look at all the things that we've been talking about, like the intentions, the performances, the overall story, the overall themes. And, you know, while you're doing a technical thing, like, hey, do this, 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 and this. I think this, this, this doesn't work. Now, now you're doing that. And while you're doing that, I'm thinking about the next thing and the thing before it. And well, if we did this, would that work? And let me mm-hmm. think about it. And you know, so I'm just thinking pure creatively. Yeah. And then you're obviously thinking creatively too, but you're also taking all the technical off my plate. Right. So I yeah. can just really focus on the thing as a whole. And that was that was so incredibly helpful. But also just as much as, you know, having a DP there to where it's like I have my shot list. And I know where I want to put the camera. I know what lens I want to put on the camera. I'm, you know, I'm more of a technical director in mm-hmm. that way. But then Chase is there to be like, you know what? If we, if instead of a 75, we go to a 50, this, it'll give us this. And if we put the camera here, it'll give us this. Yeah. And let me just show you that. And yep. you see how much better that looks. And your idea with the shot is this, but I think this conveys it better because of X, Y, and Z. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, wow. You know what? You're right. Yeah. You bring this exact same thing to the table. Yeah. Whereas I get to be like, you know, the flashes mm-hmm. was pretty much all you. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't really like, with the action bits, I've done a lot of action. I'm very mm-hmm. specific with my action. So it's like cut right here, time remap this just like this, you know, yeah. punch in this much and do this. But with the flashes, it was like, I want it to feel like this. Yeah. This is what the point of each flash is. This is mm-hmm. how they are should build and yep. this is what they should be doing. And then you went off and crafted that because I was like, I'm not really sure how we right. can make that do that. <laughs> and then you went off and did that. Mm-hmm. And that that's very much my relationship with the DP. This is how I want it to look and feel, but I'm not really sure. Like, I think if I would have edited those, I, it would have been like me, you know, doing the cinematography. Mm-hmm. I could have got it 80% of the way there, right. you know, yeah. whereas like people like you and Chase and Booth will take it that extra 20% for sure to get that 100% yeah. hidden on the mark. That's, I mean, that's the thing that I've firsthand noticed, but then also just from reading and, and looking into careers, because I do get pretty into career paths of my favorite editors and favorite editor directors, but a similar through line that I've seen in a lot of directors is that they learn how to direct on set and then they learn how to direct in pre-production and then they learn how to direct in post-production. And then a lot (laughs) of times the last thing is how to direct in the edit. So for me in sitting here. Yeah. I mean, I can relate to that. Yeah. That sounds right. So like sitting here cutting for you and you as my director, and we're working on this film, it's like I'm freeing you up to direct. Yeah. Because you wouldn't have been able to direct had you been cutting it on your own. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, if you're the one doing the cutting, then you're not being objective, as objective as you can be. You're being very subjective. And that's the other thing. I'm not the one having to comb through all the footage. So I'm not getting intensely familiar with the footage. I know what I shot. Mm -hmm. And I can remember what's there. Hey, I'm pretty sure we got this because that's what I liked. And, you know, but it's not like when I'm editing where it becomes so mathematical, Mm -hmm. I get to stay free and way more objective. (laughs) And and it all goes structured because you've seen my projects. (laughs) They're terrible. (laughs) It's so bad. Yeah. I just don't have the attention span to be structured <laughs> you need it uh if you're editing no don't just, you could just do it you do it. <laughs> I'll do it i'll do it no i think that's my view of nearly any director 
fill in the blank relationship. It's that that other part of the relationship should be focused on allowing the director to direct like that. And that's what makes that collaboration and that uh, relationship work is because the director has a lot to do especially in film. I mean, things get a little bit different in TV, but especially in film. So every step of the process, and you know this with music, and you know this with your sound designer, you know that with all of these things, it's like they need to free you up to direct, and that's when we're going to collectively arrive at like like a film. Yeah, totally. It's just, it is definitely a group effort. Yeah, for sure. The village raising the baby. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that I, I, I talked about with Booth too, actually. But- Moving away from ballistic. Just okay. story as a whole. How do you like see that? Like when you're approaching a film, is there anything specific that you're thinking about? Or you're just like, this is what this is and wants to be. And it, it sort of unfolds in front of you. Or are you thinking about story in a specific way? Like, I know it, that's well, kind of a weird question. Like when I have the footage in front of me in Premiere or when I... Even the script. Yeah. Any of it. I'm still trying to work out my relationship with the script. I don't know about the script. I mean, I read the script. I love reading scripts. I read as many scripts as I can. I think you have to if you want to be in any aspect of filmmaking yeah for sure but as far as like what's my relationship with the script i don't know i just enjoy reading it and i'm like this is going to be a dope movie (laughs) um and so for me at at an early stage when i'm reading the script i definitely don't give any notes unless i'm invited and if i am invited it's like the notes that i've found myself giving or having thoughts about the script are all things of how I would approach it if I had the film on my hard drive. Nothing right. that is super meaningful right. at this point for anybody, really. But that's kind of what I mean. Like, um, you have the footage now. Yeah. And, I mean, you read the script. Mm-hmm. It's like, are you thinking about the story overall in a certain way as you start to dive into it? Or is it like you just take one bite at a time? Yeah. For, for scripted content, it's if I have all of the footage, it's sitting down and cutting to the script because I think at the very minimum that has to be done. Like you can't, as an editor, you should not deviate from the script on your first cut lest you be fired. I mean, you just (laughs) need to put together, it's going to deviate and things are going to change, but you, and even if you're like, well, this isn't working, you still have to put together something on script. So would you call that like the assembly cut for the director basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I would essentially do is as the assembly cut. And there's going to be a lot of versions within that, like things while I'm cutting scene five that I could go down this path. I'll go down that path, but then I'll hide it. I'll put it in a little box and I'll pull it out later. Uh, right now it's like the assembly as scripted. Be- <laughs> Look what I did real quick. <laughs> just now. I just rewrote it without your input. I hope you like it. Um, <laughs> is like a terrible way about, and you're not going to yeah. make any friends that way. And sure. so, but the film does begin to reveal itself, I think at the assembly and whether it's because of a really hard, scene that you know we don't have a ton of coverage for this that the other thing a way through it is this i think you know you can the film starts to reveal itself but for me that first pass has to be like as scripted and then it's just like a lot of conversation with with you and like with the director and discovering together what the film kind of wants to be and then it's like polishing what moments do we want to polish in what way to give a specific light or a specific color on this commentary and And so there's definitely an editor's job is keeping track of the micro pacing, like within cut to cut to cut, but also the macro pacing of like the movement of the film, the movement of this specific emotion of this character, like keeping an eye on all these things, because what you do in minute two could affect something that happens in minute 14 and yeah. like keeping an eye on that so that when you go back and you start messing with minute two, you understand the impact that it could have in minute 14 and you're just aware of it. So you don't break things. What about transitions? Are you thinking about, cause you know, you're editing each scene in its own sequence usually, yeah. right? So yeah, an assembly. And then as soon as I can, I put them together. Right. Yeah. And then are, are you thinking about transitions when you're, you're assembling them in their own sequences or are you just like, let me get the scene together and then we'll see. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about transitions pretty early Yeah, because otherwise it just feels so chunky. Have you come across the, because I, I think about transitions when scripting. Yeah. How's this scene going to move into this? 
scene yeah. and all that to try to get the most seamless transitions as possible. Mm-hmm. And also like ballistic, finding places to really connect and say something. Yeah. Like our transitions were to inform you this is the same person. Yeah. Which hopefully that worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but have you come across any issues where it's like transitions were not thought about? Now what? Yeah. What do you do there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you you build a transition yeah you hope you have the footage hiding to do that transition i mean there's a lot of creative things you can do with bringing in audio way early transitioning it audio wise not necessarily visually you can let the visual be a little clunky but audio smooths it out and makes it cool or yeah vibey. yeah that's usually like for me it's like audio is my transition yeah. i don't like to do visual for transitions sure. very often do you are you the same way or do you do you have any like little visual tricks that you like to do too i mean you can transition with match movement visually mm-hmm. a lot there's times where i'll have done that to where someone walks off screen left to right and then you cut to a wide shot of the building and cars are going left to right as well and it's just like it's a seamless cut because the movement within is good and then it gives us a little bit of a break and everybody can kind of take a breath and then we're gonna head into the next scene and hopefully the transition between scene two and three is a little bit more thought out yeah so there's definitely some things with like match movement where you use the movement to hide your cut so that all of a sudden you're transitioned and you didn't really even necessarily realize we just cut to the outside of a building for five seconds more or less and you have audio kind of running underneath it but i do tend like i cut pretty audio deep and i like to (laughs) yes you do (laughs) i think ballistic has like and and this is just my sequence rough cut is like 60 some channels deep but i just like to build my audio deep um i also think kind of jumping back a few conversations like one of the editor's main jobs is to communicate what was intended in the cut like because we're spending a lot of time together and you probably won't spend this much time in the other areas together yeah and talking about pretty meaningful things and so i need to build into my cut those conversations yeah so that when audio gets it they're like oh, okay this even though it's rough even though it is going to completely change i understand what they were going for mm-hmm. in the edit room because it's all laid out here yeah i was i was funny enough i was thinking about that on the way here today i was like man if something happened and i was unable to finish this film like right now if i died <laughs> yeah. to go very dark like how would this film finish and i think you're the only person that could take it the rest of the way like you could actually direct the rest of the film because you know every bit of the intention we've had all those conversations you built in you know what the music should be doing yeah. you know what the sound effects should be doing so you could yeah. actually finish the film for me i would do it uh, you would do it I would, would you do, do this it. for me i would do it lucas if i die if I my plane goes down it. thank you lucas directed the show by, must go on directed by lucas Arger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no you son of a bitch <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh yeah i mean the in your timeline also like and then the other thing too i think i mean if we both died we're screwed <laughs> we're screwed i don't know but i feel like we have our, a roadmap i feel like our timeline yeah, just could follow get, the gps exactly i feel like the timeline could get handed off and mm-hmm. the intentions are built into the rough uh, cut josh <laughs> yeah. if we both die i'll make sure that the timeline gets completed thank you just hand the timeline off don't touch anything josh touch don't nothing. touch a thing. <laughs> no, yeah, I think... Uh, Everyone listening is like, what the hell? Who's Josh? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Josh. Just kidding. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how I jumped off on that tangent. No, it's great. No, it's great. <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, it's so false. Yeah, no. Oh, no, no it's, it's great. totally great. Anyway, anyway, back glad to you the wasted point. all of our time. <laughs> Ugh. Um, <laughs> something you were saying before uh, made me think about it. I, I think of, like, just editing and pace as, like, language and, you know, you need punctuation. You need periods and commas and exclamation points, question marks and, Mm -hmm. you know, chapter breaks and things like that. And, you know, like you were saying to jumping to the wide and giving people a moment before you go into the next thing, you know, that's very much a period or a chapter break really, because, you know, without it, it just feels like a run on sentence sometimes. And it's like, man, why isn't this working? And why is all the impact gone? Mm -hmm. Why is all the emotion ripped out of this? And we, we came across this problem when we were doing ballistic and trying different versions is because we were putting commas where we should have been putting periods. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. I think a lot of that, like, I'm not thinking that when we're doing it, but that's really what's happening. And I think it's, uh, at least for me, it's like gut type stuff. Like my gut is saying no. And why does this feel wrong? And then 
and then hunting that down. Yeah. But I think that's an interesting way to look at it. For sure. And there's a ton in this, I mean, whatever. There's a ton of similarities between, for me personally, between like editing and poetry because of that. Yeah. Because of totally. the super unique use of punctuation and line breaks versus punctuation and subtext and what the poem is about versus what the poem is saying versus yeah. the flow of the poem. And so there's a lot of times kind of going back to the beginning of the conversation, there's a lot of times like if I have a lot of free time and I, you know, I'm not cutting something today, I'll grab a poem that I've read recently that I like and download archival footage and cut something to that poem because there's built in pace to the poem and there's built in yeah. pace that the poet intended. And it's a really good pace exercise to take something that has been meticulously considered with the placement of the punctuation for a rhythmic purpose, for a pacing purpose, not necessarily for a grammatical purpose. And then, well, why did they break the line here? I don't know, cut something like that, expound upon this line from an editorial standpoint, and you can start to play around with pace, which like comes into play in every area of editing, whether you're doing commercial editing or narrative editing or documentary editing, like having a good handle on pace and saying like, this doesn't feel right and then making it feel right. Yeah. There's a really big gap there. There's It's one level to arrive at a place where you have the sensibility to say the pacing doesn't feel right. And then there's another level of like craftsmanship where I know something doesn't right and this is how we can make it right. Yeah, totally. Huge steps. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of deal with both through the entire process from writing to yeah, you know, sure. finishing. It's just like sure. even musically, like I get sent a track and... I'm watching it to the thing and it's like, uh, this is not feeling correct. And the emotion is not hitting where it should be hitting. I'm not a hundred percent sure why, but I know it's not. And, you know, sometimes to, <laughs> to Daniel's credit, he's very patient with me because, you know, it's not that often where it's like, I don't know why, but no, mm -hmm. but sometimes it is. And it's like, I'm not a hundred percent sure why this isn't working. Yeah. Maybe you do. Cause this is what you do. But right in this moment, here's what I'm feeling. And I should be feeling this. You know, I've, I've said that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I say it to everybody. I collaborate at some point. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why I don't like that, but I don't like that. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I try to make that as rare as possible, but sometimes I don't have an answer. So yeah. I just have to be honest instead of creating some BS answer. Yeah, right. And being like, hey, I don't like it. Can you figure out why? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I think it's like similar to getting notes. Sometimes people don't like stuff and it's what they're pointing out there don't like is actually not the problem. Yeah. It's crazy how often that happens. Yeah, for sure. And I think all of those things build over time between a director and editor. Like the next film we cut, we have a huge foundation that we've worked for a long time on this one delay as far as like a shorthand and as like, I know what you mean when you say this and we can arrive at these things. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like kind of going back to what I was saying, like I love to follow careers of directors and director editor duos because a lot of times, more time than I think in almost any other craft in the filmmaking process, directors and editors stick together over a career. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love most about editing is because you build these really long lasting deep relationships and the films that you create are only made possible by the history that the director and editor have shared. I mean, one of my favorite is Denis and Joe Walker and the films that they just constantly come out. I mean, from Sicario into Arrival into Blade Runner, like the intense reworking that seems to have gone into Arrival was only made possible by the history of the relationship they have and the trust that they built with each other in Sicario and, you know, collaborating before that. You know what I mean? And so yeah. there's like, that's the stuff that, I get super excited about with making films is because you're establishing relationships that only with the combination of this, these two people and their relationship is something of this scale and something of this meaning possible to exist. Like that's fun. Yeah, I totally agree. And looking forward to the next one. We're going to make, another. we're going to make another, Definitely. we're working towards some stuff. Yes. Hopefully we'll talk about eventually. Yeah. Okay. We've gone past an hour. I don't know if this will be past an hour. We'll see what happens once it's edited. <laughs> yep. But thank you, Lucas. Thank you. What What would you say, just, you know, 13, 15 year old kid starting out, one tip, hey, do this. Do everything in the process, for sure. Like you have to have some experience because you have to respect every department in the process of filmmaking. You're eventually going to have to respect that and you're going to work with them. 
maybe not face to face, but you're going to work with the result of what they've brought. And so understanding the process is huge. And so definitely try and get your hands on as many levels of the process as you possibly can. But then it just comes down to like, you have to cut, like you have to cut. Even if nobody sees the things that you cut, you have to cut. Even now I cut a lot of things that nobody sees out of archival footage, out of found footage, things like this, just to continually work on and strengthen the muscles of storytelling through the visual medium and through cutting. And so other Other than like getting your hands on every stage of the process, at least a little bit, it's like you just have to cut. Yeah, Yeah. totally agree. All right. All right. Well, let's get back to work. Sounds good. (laughs) Sweet. So that's it for today. If you want to find out more about Lucas, you can jump over to filmriot.com forward slash podcast, find the episode page for this episode. And we have links for him there, including a link to his personal website and his social media links. And next week, we're going to have Ryan Booth on the show. We're going to be talking about uh, our views of directing, especially in a short or indie film sort of world. There's also some naughty words in that one too. So if you would like us to mute them, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know what you think. And until next time, Don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.